So John, you wanted to comment about the uh, the parametric model for soil water characteristic curve. Yeah, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time in this uh, subject matter looking at characteristic curves. And so um, when we see that there's Van Genoekten, there's Brooks and Corey, there's Kosigi, there's all these different curves, which one do we choose and how do we get there? And one of the things that maybe a little story is very helpful, um, we were trying to understand oil movement in soils. And we'll see this later on in another presentation about capillary barriers. And the thing was, we could not get the oil to move correctly if we use the Van Genoekten model. And why was that? The thing is, it's nice and smooth. Everything's nice and smooth. But in fact, in many soils, there is a place where the soil is saturated. It's 100% saturated. And it would take a, you have to overcome that pressure to get that first air in. And the Van Genoekten model lets you creep right up to saturation um, smoothly. So what would happen if you use the Van Genoekten model is the oil would go right into the soil that had, was supposedly full of water. So Whereas the Brooks and Corey model, it would be supported by the water up until it exceeded that air entry pressure that the Brooks and Corey model explicitly shows. John, do you want to point out here this air entry value, the sharpness of the air entry value? Right, exactly. So, so looking at this sort of curve, you see how this is a nice rounded curve, but it has a, a vertical section. And so, so these different models, and looking particularly here at the clay, how nice and rounded it is, that sort of roundedness, it is really accurate in many soils for many, many situations, but there are times when you don't want that if it is really, if you're looking at, at processes which are at that cusp. So the point is not that one model is better than the other. The really the point is that these models have particular applications that they can really benefit, you can uh, benefit by using the right model for the right problem. Many times, many, many times, uh, the Van Gogh model or would, the, the Brooks and Corey would give equal predictions, but there are those occasions when you have to use so to, care. So to summarize what John was saying is that uh, in uh, porous media, typically with large pores, we have this, uh, this uh, jerkiness or this uh, abruptness of changes from uh, saturation to unsaturation is indeed a point, and uh, smoothing it would actually uh, misses about on the uh, physical process. What I'd like to add to the discussion also in the context of this slide is that there are other parametric models like the one proposed by Kusugi, and you can find it in the class notes, mm -hmm. where the uh, parameters actually have a statistical meaning in the sense that uh, they can be associated with statistics of the pore size distribution. Uh, one last comment is that uh, the Brooks and Corey model that I uh, quoted as 64 uh, was uh, preceded by other models that were before their assuming power laws. And there is a whole range of uh, models that are used in the petroleum industry, and you'll hear the J. Levert function, that are basically a uh, manifestation of the same phenomena. Now, in the soil, Danny, one of the things we have to be also careful of is when we say things get saturated. So we look at this and we say there's saturated moisture content. But in the real world, it almost never happens. The yeah. only way we get things saturated in the laboratory is we pull a full vacuum and put in de-aired water and we get the, all the pores filled. But in the field, we often have conditions where there's trapped air. We almost always, in fact, and in, even in the lab if we're not super careful. So people, you'll hear terminology like saturated or field saturated. And this is a big difference because in the real world, that trapped air fills exactly the largest pores and that can really interrupt the flow of water. So watch out on the, on the saturated end, although in the ideal lab conditions, we've got this nice uh, setup. In the real world, oftentimes, it'll be backed off by 10% from that value, and that can have a pretty big impact. Good. Uh, one last point about the parameter, the residual water content, which you see here at the edge of the, uh, these three characteristic curves. Notice that the residual water content for clay is much, much larger than that for sand. And the reason being that the residual water content uh, is often found to be proportional to the specific surface area of the soil. How much water can you uh, can be retained in the soil simply by virtue of covering the surfaces by thin liquid films? So we'll come back to this point uh, later on when we talk about water retention on soil surfaces as liquid films.